Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joe Minicosi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, and thank you all for having me uh, up here and allowing us to do this research with you all. With uh, Josh, Josh McCarty's here with me. Um, Josh did most of the magic that you're about to see um, on the screen. Um, it's, it's, it's fun to, to, to do this analysis for us. For us, we're measuring cities and taking a look at how cities tick financially. Um, but it's also personal for me. I, I grew up in Rome, New York. Do you all know Rome? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> You visited lately? <laughs> um, yeah, so if you, if you, for those of you that don't know where Rome is, it's just straight in the middle of the Erie Canal. Uh, Rome has kind of done some amazing stuff to itself. When I was a kid, um, that's, that I'm going to tell you a quick little story about, uh, Rome has gotten to such a point where it basically markets itself by all the things that are near it including Buffalo, you know, it's like only three hours away. Um, so when you're visiting Buffalo, just swing through Rome, right? Um, the heyday for Rome was the Erie Canal when it started and went east and west from Rome. Uh, we're in the Erie Canal book, you know, or the Erie Canal song, you know, you know that song. Um, incidentally, no one in the South knows this song for some reason, but um, this is what Rome looked like in the heyday. This is, this is Main Street um, in my hometown. And when I was a kid, um, we were struggling with a lot of the things of the post-industrial society that you all were struggling with. I remember the picket lines, I remember the mill closings, I remember all that. I remember bringing spaghetti dinners down to the folks standing at the picket lines in minus 20 degree weather and stuff like that. That's what I grew up with. Um, their community was challenged with a, with a way to deal with that. How do we deal with reinventing our city? And with the creative thought in my town, um, Fort Stanwix was actually in Rome, New York. Do y'all know the pivotal war, the Revolutionary War at Fort Stanwix? You know, the this turning point that we all heard about, right? It wasn't that huge. It wasn't huge enough to say, hey, let's tear down downtown and rebuild the fort, right? Which is what they did. So basically, all of this stuff got knocked down. All of the heart of my city got wiped out when we got this. So, you know, that's, that's my downtown now. We occasionally get a Canadian tourist, and that's about it. So, now if that wasn't good enough, what was left of downtown, sorry to the Canadians in the room, um, we, we took what was left of Main Street and wiped it out with a pedestrian wall. Um, we built a couple parking garages because, you know, you need more parking garages, right? Um, for all the people that are going to visit, we built a plaza on the pedestrian mall. So we didn't have enough open space, we went ahead and added more open space on the open space. New City Hall, of course we needed that. and then. A surface parking lot. We have two parking decks. We had to have a surface parking lot right next to City Hall as well. They built a mall across the Erie Boulevard, and then they did this really weird Le Corbusier meets the Ponte Vecchio. They built this concrete bridge that shot across the highway, and on it there were shops. It was wide enough for shops. They gave everybody that was torn out of this area, they gave them a grant to relocate in the property, the new development. Of the 280 businesses, that were given those checks, guess how many relocated into this mall area? 18. 200 and some odd merchants in my hometown took those checks and moved to Florida. They're like, sayonara, we're out of here. That's what happened in my town. The, the heart was ripped out. I thought this was normal. I thought this is how all cities behaved. You know, so I, this is my hometown. This is what's left. So maybe y'all should visit. It's only three hours away. Just swing through, right? This is the church where I went to church. This is, I used to sit in that building and just stare at the ceilings. This is the reason why I went to architecture school. Um, and when I went to architecture school, I had the luck of stumbling into these two. They were my professors, Elizabeth Plater Zybrick and, and Andrea Stuani. Uh, two of the founders of the movement that's happening a couple blocks away from here, the Congress for New Urbanism. When I went to college, one of the things they made us do was draw a neighborhood. That was our first architectural project. I drew a park down the street, I drew sidewalks, I drew a, an elementary school that everybody could walk to, candy stores. I drew my neighborhood. And it was hilarious to me that I would get an A on that project. Uh -huh. And then I started looking at all my peers and what they were drawing. And I started understanding what they were up against. This is an architecture school that was getting into urban design. They were getting into urban design because of what was happening in Florida. What was happening in Florida was a seamless 
environment of sprawl all over the place. And they were trying to train us to understand urban design as architects because we were responsible as graduates for producing this stuff. And they wanted to change that. Now for me, this was, this was wow, I didn't realize people actually built housing. That didn't happen in my town. We're, just, we're fleeing, right? We had this growth, that leading to traffic, um, leading to these environments that people are creating for people without people in mind, right? This is happening all over the South, all over the, the hot hotbed of, um, of growth in the Sun Belt. To me, this was kind of crazy. Now, we kind of joke. We're just like, well, it's sprawl. It's this kind of cartoonish environment. But the sad reality is it's a place that people are making for themselves. This is San Antonio, uh, Texas. And it's, this is happening all around the country. So I had the luck of going to another Rome while I was in architecture school. I went to Rome, Italy. And... Um, this is where I lived, and this is where I went to school, and this is where I ate. And the whole time I'm there, I'm thinking, how did this Rome stay alive, and my Rome is dead as a doornail? What decisions did they make to keep this town alive for thousands and thousands of years, and my, my community can't make it past 200 years? You know, and it really kind of got me to think differently about cities. What are the choices people make? What is, what is unique to your city, or how does your city grow versus my city? And to me, it's a lot like people. We're all people, but we're all totally different, right? So for me, it's a DNA thing. The cities have a DNA. They have a tra trajectory in time. Much in the way, this is how I started life, right? This is, this is me when I was three months old and I had hair. I was the, the angry baby. And this is what I'm going to become. So I'm going to become Papa, whether I like it or not, right? There's a lot I can't change in that. But there are some things I can change. Or more importantly, I'm looking at this guy, my dad. I have two genetic issues. I'm genetically Italian, you can obviously tell that. Um, but we also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease in my family. Every Minicozy male has this in them. I have it. So my dad's had a seven bypass heart surgery. I got that coming, in, coming at me with the choices that I make today, though. So I could choose to exercise. I could choose to eat right. I could choose to lower my stress level, do all of the things to try to minimize the impact of that activity. What is Buffalo doing for that? Who's Buffalo's role model? What, what, what heart attacks are you trying to avoid? What do we learn from this past experience Buffalo has been through? More importantly, what is Amherst learning from Buffalo? And what is, what is Hamburg learning from Buffalo? These are the conversations to have in your community. You have an unbelievable role model right here in your city. So that's one lesson. The second lesson, I want to give you a quick little test. I know it's after work hours, but no one's going to fail this test. And for those of you that were in the afternoon session, no shouting out the answers. So I'm going to give you a quick little test to tell me how many shapes you see in this next image. All right? When it's, you need five seconds. It's a real simple kid's puzzle. Just tell me how many shapes you see. For those of you that were here this afternoon, no shouting out the answers, so I know who you are. Um, here we go. Ready? Go. Okay, how many shapes did y'all see? Nine? 20. 20, oh wow, 20, okay. 16. 16, anybody wanna go higher than 20? Probably 40. 40, okay. No, it's up to you, it's up to y'all. Okay, well, how many kids were on the school bus? Anyone? 32. What time was it on the clock? What's amazing about the way that our brains operate, there's a, there's a term. There. What's that? Didn't see that. Yeah, because I asked you a question. We are programmed to eliminate information. And sometimes that can be a detriment, right? What's the effect of the nerve renewal program in your community? What will actually happen as we think it through? We'll go into a fast mode of thinking and eliminate information. There's a term, uh, Daniel Kahneman is a behavioral psychologist. You didn't see the five kids on the bus. You didn't see that it was 10 after 10 on the clock. That we have a fast mode of thinking and a slow mode of thinking. Our slow mode is a processing mode. We take in more information and think it through. If I was sitting in your passenger seat while you're driving, think of the thousands of decisions you make when you're driving a car. You're looking for kids to walk out in the street. You're looking for other cars. If I were to sit in the passenger seat and ask you the square root of 32 divided by the, the square root of 722, what's going to happen? You're going to want to slow down. You're going to want to stop. You're going to have to pull over, plug a pencil, and kind of work through that or pull out a calculator. We can't process information, we process it differently. And the questions that we ask of our community, sometimes we miss information hiding in plain sight. So what I'm going to do here 
for this presentation from here going forward or use those two lessons. That's it. I put everything up front. I want you to see information that is hiding in plain sight in your community. And I also want you to ask a different question about what Buffalo is. So with that, the question of what a city is is the most important thing for me. This is Asheville. This is where I live now. Uh, you can see why they call it the Smoky Mountains. Julian Price is the founder of a real estate development company that is the parent company of our company. This, it's a for-profit real estate development company in Asheville called Public Interest Projects. We do conventional downtown re revitalization. We fix buildings in the downtown, but we also use 25% of our money to see businesses. So the stuff in black are new businesses that we started. The first vegetarian restaurant in Asheville was uh, one that we put money behind to help get them up off the ground. Oop, getting feedback here, sorry. So for us, it's bringing the information forward to our community. <laughs> How do we get data to our elected officials to get them to understand what's going on in downtown revitalization? For us, it's business. But we have to understand that our broader community, we need to understand what's good for them, what's good, good in development. So what was happening in our downtown, this is what Asheville was worth in 1990. Who's been to Asheville in this group? Oh, wow. That's great. Thanks for shopping in Asheville and eating our restaurants. It's awesome. Um, Asheville was worth $104 million. It, in the beginning of the 1990s, the city invested $26 million into uh, streetscape projects and parking garages to start to do revitalization. What happened next, these first two steps were just filling up existing buildings that were just sitting there fallow, left behind since the Depression. We didn't get a new building in Asheville until about 2008. But what happened is a $26 million investment here yielded $400 million worth of private investment into our community. Right? Let me show you how that works. So for us, it's thinking about land like a product. When, car when, when farmers go out and till their soil, they're making an economic decision. They're thinking about the crop yield per acre, the fertilizer per acre, the water per acre. They don't just go out and just plow open the whole, f whole f farm, do they? What's the crop yield in the marketplace? All these decisions. Can we do the same things with cities? If this is one of our buildings here, this is a rehab project that we did. The city came in and did a streetscape project here. We took it on the chin in our community because that was, in my world, in North Carolina, that's considered a subsidy, even though it's a public sidewalk. It's considered a subsidy that we got a garbage can, a bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. Why are you investing in that downtown, putting money in front of their building, was the question. So we're like, all right, guilty as charged, fine. $20,000 worth of public investment. We took this building from $300,000 of value to $11 million of value. The way that we see that, one way we could see it, it's a 3,500% increase in our taxes, which is a tax penalty to us to fix a building. We could see it that way. But we see it as a 3,500% increase in our community's wealth. The community now has 3,500% more money to do whatever it wants with, right? Build in a greenway, do whatever. Anybody have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? You know, this is, the community as a corporation has now yielded more wealth off an asset, right? That's the simple economics of what's going on here. Now, people say to me, they're like, yeah, Joe, that's fine. That's $11 million, but this Walmart over here is worth $20 million of paying a property tax of $221,000 as their tax bill. It's a huge number. That's, that's fair enough. This is, this is my house. This is my wife Caroline here. These are my dogs. My dogs think they're lions. They're a little weird. Um, but Caroline and I pay $2,000 in taxes. We're on a tenth of an acre. So if you had a one acre cookie cutter that just fell into my neighborhood, it hit 10 houses, right? So 10 times $2,000 is $20,000 an acre. Y'all get this? Mm -hmm. If you lift that one acre cookie cutter up into space, shoot it over onto the Walmart and hit its tax bill. It's hitting 34 acres. So on a per acre basis, it's not, it's not $200,000. It's actually 6500 Now, if you had our building downtown, this is what you get. So if you're looking at tax flow, if you're an elected official making decisions, what kind of cash flow do you want to have in your community? You want $6,000, $20,000, or $600,000? y'all get that? Now, I was presenting this in, in Denver, Colorado, and I wanted to make it simple for them to understand this in Denver. Um, they're a little distracted right now. So I said to them, 
Okay, if you had an acre to grow something in Colorado, what are you going to grow? They kind of got the picture. This joke works in Asheville, too, by the way. Um, so, you know, you're probably saying, you know, Joe, that's not fair. There's retail taxes. We get retail taxes out of, out of the Walmart. So let's go ahead and run the numbers. The overall sales of a typical Walmart is about $77 million. The city gets eight, or the, the, the taxes collected at eight cents on the dollar. The city gets 27% of that eight cents on that. So your actual yield is just a portion of a portion of that, right? So that's 47,000 an acre. The total taxes, property taxes plus retail taxes to the city are $51,000 an acre. That's what you get in property taxes out of our building per acre to the city. You add the retail taxes, now you're cooking with gas. And how do y'all want to look at this? Jobs? What are the jobs per acre? 70, we have 74 people working in that building per acre versus their six. We've even got residents per acre. We've got residential up here, remember? 90 units an acre in that building. One of my friends calls this the Moneyball shot of cities. Have y'all read the book Moneyball or possibly seen the movie? Now, this is essentially what we're doing here. I should get a residual on that book. It's, I recommend it to every audience. Um, but it's basically looking at the function of business with under a different set of metrics and making different decisions. So there's a reason why the Oakland Athletics continue to get into the playoffs, even though they have one of the lowest paid salaries in all of baseball. They're looking at different data points. So understand what I'm doing here. I don't have a CPA. I don't have a finance degree. I'm not an MBA. This is really simple math to do analysis. It's just putting land as a quotient, which is all that you all have, particularly to the county. Erie County can't go off and annex another county. So that land function is the most important thing. So speaking of counties, that was the city's cash flow. We also have a county cash flow under that, right? We both pay city and county taxes. So the average county resident in Asheville is paying about $1,200 in county taxes per acre. The city resident, you'll see, is actually paying more in county taxes per acre than somebody out in the county. This is a different phenomenon than what you have. You have townships, one up against the other. We have this whole un unincorporated area that we have to contend with. When you add retail taxes into this, this is our mall at $8,000 an acre. You see why somebody would choose commercial over residential. You get a significant bump in value because they're more expensive buildings. But then let, let's not stop there. Let's bring downtown into it. Here's our building and county taxes per acre at $250,000. And here's the mall at $8,000. That's the bump that you get out of the downtown to the county. Now, when we have a problem with the police or we call and we need police, the sheriff doesn't show up. So we are actually contributing money that we're not gaining that back from the county. So what I'm trying to do is also change the frame of how we look at government. Now this is from Webster's Dictionary. This is the definition of incorporation. Incorporation is the forming of a new corporation. The corporation may be a government, or sorry, a, a, a business, a nonprofit organization, a sports club, or a government of a new city or town. So in essence, you all are shareholders in a, in a, in a town, a city, but also a county. You're shareholders in that corporate, corporate environment. There's a charter, there's a board of directors, there's a CEO, there's a function of your ownership. You own stock in those businesses. Does that make sense? So the city is essentially a finite boundary of land that is a commodity of real estate. We have a $13 million portfolio, which is a huge amount of money in my perspective. But what's unbelievable to me is that my city is worth $10 billion. That's B with for a billion. That's three times Donald Trump's portfolio wealth. <laughs> Asheville is three times the Donald. Or another way of looking at it is we are worth more than all the professional sports teams in all of North Carolina. The Panthers are only worth a billion. Did y'all get that? We're like 10 times the Panthers. So um, that cash flow is critically important. Understanding the value, but also the cost. We were doing work in Sarasota, Florida, and they actually asked us to do the, the, the cost stream of a project. So we went ahead and, and, and analyzed it. And the way that we thought about it is like a typical developer. If I were to build this godforsaken place somewhere in Arizona, hopefully none of you have an investment here. Um, when I build this as a developer, I keep track of all my hard costs and soft costs, my permit fees, my architecture fees, every cost of every linear foot of curb and gutter in here. And then I divide it by the rooftops. I divide it by how many buildings are in it. That's my unit of production. When this thing gets plugged onto this street up here, 
as a corporate shareholder in this community, does your government go out there and figure out what this costs in police, fire, schools, uh, the roads to get out here, all that infrastructure that was built, the public buildings, the parks, the schools, does your government go out there and put a price tag on that, that the sales tax or the, the property tax equal the cost of that in your community? No. They send an assessor. Is there any assessors in the audience? Uh, is there? Good, good, this is awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, they just send an assessor out there to just kind of wag, wave their magic wand and come up with a value, and then you're taxed on value. Well, what does value have to do with costs? Nothing. If I, had, if I was Logitech, saw a, com a computer supplies place, if I were putting this in the marketplace, do I just stick this little laser pointer out in the marketplace and just say, whatever you guys want, we're going to just guess what the value could be? No. Of course, they're figuring out all the plastic, the software, the material, all the stuff that it took to make this. That's where they start their price. Then they add on marketing, profit, and whatever. We're not doing this for cities. We're operating on like a 17th century model of finance. Now, I'm not the first person to come on to this idea. It was actually started with this guy here. In the 1970s, the Nixon administration published a document called The Cost of Sprawl. Do you all know this book? When you hear the term sprawl, do you know it was like the Nixon administration that shoved that out there? It's kind of fascinating. I went through grad school and never learned about this book. It's kind of, it's kind of mind blowing. Um, so the state of Florida actually did their own version of it. Oh, by the way, this is a little funky. It's the early 70s, so they actually have an emotional cost of sprawl in it. It's a little wavy gravy-ish. Um, in, the, in the 90s, the, the state of Florida did their own version of it. And they actually they did the public facility cost per dwelling unit. From downtown, they went into downtown Orlando and figured it out. And they went through all these different communities. Wellington's out in suburban, way western Palm Beach County. And the more you spread people out, the more the facility cost goes up to the community. And it's really simple, folks. If you have a mile of pipe and you put five people on it, it's more expensive than a mile of pipe with 5,000 people on it. There's a unit savings when you start putting more people on it, and it's the distance of that pipe. So we took a couple of those from downtown to the burbs. We went out into the, into the burbs, grabbed some, right at the edge of the county, we grabbed a 357 unit multifamily product here. And then we said, let's go into the downtown and let's pluck out 357 units and let's compare them apples to apples. Let's let, to let them run their own pro formas. So here's how it works. Um, so here's the zero line. The cost of land for the suburban pattern here in light green and the urban pattern in dark green. So it took 3.4 acres to house the same number of people that it took 30 acres. Right? That's what it takes when you spread people out, you consume more real estate. That's one-tenth the land consumption inside the portfolio of Sarasota County. It costs 57% as much to service the downtown as the burbs, yet you're making 870% more money versus, versus the suburban pattern. Now, we were just pulling this straight out of the, the tax rolls. We just, it was really simple stuff. We just ran the, the millage, and there you go. Now, if this is my mortgage, and that's my annual payment, and this is Josh's mortgage, and that's his annual payment, how long will it take the two of us to pay off our mortgages? It'll take me 42 years. It takes Josh three. Anybody look to the municipal budget? Do we geoposition where our financial investments are and where our costs are and our revenues? We just have, we don't. We just have one huge budget called public works or police. But we're missing this. There's a cash flow going on here. In real estate development world, we don't have our nightclub keeping our vegetarian restaurant afloat. They're two separate pots of money. They have two separate cash flows in them, and they both have to defend themselves. So what happens here, if we were to do cost, revenue, and time, I can do an ROI, my return on investment. So for this, for this county, the ROI for the downtown stuff is an 18% ROI. For the birds, it's a 2% ROI. Now, if you were to invest in, let's say, a Christmas savings account, what kind, of, what kind of percentage return do you want? Do you want the 18% return? Or do you want the 2% return? You guys got quiet all of a sudden. Is this, <laughs> is this too painful to look at at night? And I was showing this to, um, we were presenting this in Idaho, and there were literally cowboys in the room. With cowboy vests, cowboy boots, a couple guys had guns. It was really kind of insane. 
And they're like, Joe, these are way too many charts for cowboys. <laughs> Just show it to us in year 20. What happens in year 20? This is what it looks like. So the counties made over their debt $34 million after 20 years. They're still in the hole $5 million bucks with a suburban pattern. Did y'all get that? Now when you look at the consumer market, what's the consumer choosing? Why? Well, advertising, they're also not accountable to their debt. So if, if I'm going to take more public infrastructure and you're not going to put me on a payback cycle of paying it off, you betcha I'm going to take it. That's a hell of a deal. This is what's happening inside your financial system. When you can't afford the next art teacher, when you can't make the next park, when you can't do the next greenway, you've lost that money. Oops. Here. You know the roads collapse in about 25 years? Yeah. So you're building more of this stuff, you actually can't build your way out of it. So um, anyway, this is to quote Chief Justice Brandeis, these are the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. The more you do the math, the more you see these, these are true. We've done this all across the country, and as you mash up the data for every dollar of county single family residential paid per acre, a city resident's paying about eight bucks to the county, the Walmart's about seven bucks, the mall is double to Walmart, as soon as you get to a two-story building, this can be in Lockport, it could be in Buffalo. As soon as you get to a two-story building, it shoots up. Three-story building shoots up, and then in a six-story building, it really gets big. What's crazy is it's just really simple, folks. For every story that you add, that's another revenue stream that comes out of it. And it's not a proportional growth, it's an exponential growth. What we're doing here is we're normalizing the land into this to understand the economics. And we really do this. We do this with other forms of efficiency. When we gauge cars, we don't gauge cars on a miles per tank basis, do we? Because we know all tanks are different. So if we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s at 650 miles per tank. You know, now you see how silly that is, right? All land is different sizes. All parcels are different sizes. We never normalize it on an acre basis. If we, so I change the, the question. Rather than per tank, let's go per, eight, per gallon. Now the numbers change. That's the whole magic of what we're doing here. That leap. On a per gallon basis, we should all be driving BMW Assetas, <laughs> 1955 technology, sorry to Prius owners. That's a very dangerous little car though. It's cute though. Anyway, that's the gimmick here. That's what we're doing. Now we were asked to kind of do your analysis, your community. Um, we did this with the park partnership, which is a, one reason for it with, a, with the help and the assistance of the NRDC. And, um, it's a huge area, but you all are already doing some great stuff. And this is a report that that uh, that, that you all done. I, who was the was, it, was it the university that was the basis of this, or the county? The county. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, that they actually analyzed what's happening from 1970 to 2010 in your community. You've actually grown more developed land, close to 80 percent more developed land, yet your population is shrinking. You all know this. Um, the, the miles driven, you've driven more miles, you've added more infrastructure costs to an already expensive city, and you're losing people. This is not a good financial formula. Um, with that, you're putting in more debt, and that basically is going to be yielding about $26 uh, million of added annual tax burden. That's annual tax burden to your region. This is expensive stuff. And then finally, I'll, I'll just close on this. Um, your vehicle miles are driving, are, are going further. The more that you drive in your region, the more that you're feeding more of those roads because the standards that the DOT use, you're just tracking your miles. As your miles go up, they actually automate putting in more roads. And what's happening is your supply is changing. So the vacant lots, you've, there were 15,000 vacant dwellings in 1970. Y'all are at about 46,000 now or 45,000. There was a headline on the newspaper just yesterday of the vacant lots and how to deal with them. So you know these problems. Uh, there's 27 football fields of parking lots in your downtown. This is your downtown turned sideways, north is to the right. Um, this is a tremendous amount of parking. So if someone says there's a parking problem, please just show them this map. Um, for us, we, we started in with that. And this is your, that we made a development time machine from 1850 of the region. So let's go ahead and play this. So it's going to animate, on the left is your population change, and you see your population exploding. 
the, the right is your um, land consumption. And you can see where it's all happening on the chart. So what's interesting here is your pattern changes after 1950. You start to submarine from a from a land uh, from a land uh, from a population perspective. Now we'll go ahead and we can get these to you. These animations they're just little computer GIF files that you can run on your computer. <laughs> you see, it's almost like a forest fire going further east. Now just kind of zooming into the Buffalo area and doing the same thing. Getting a little funky with the monitor over there. So you've got growth and development happening. It's just happening in a place where it's more expensive for y'all. So, just to, you know, we're map nerds, and we kind of get a little techy with the data. This is your Erie County. You're 1,200 square miles. You're about a million people, 900,000 people. This is Rhode Island at the same scale. Erie County is bigger than Rhode Island. Did y'all know that? Um, Rhode Island has 1,200 people in it. Um, you're also, just for fun, we threw Dubai in here. Um, Dubai is 1,500 acres. The, the, the Erie Niagara region is bigger than Dubai. Dubai has two, 2 million people in it. So think of yourselves that way. You're, you're, as much as you have these towns and communities, you have a region that you're operating that's bigger than a state and bigger than a country. Don't think of it that way. So we kind of come into this sort of like doctors look at your bodies. You know, there's technology that you can use that you can see different data. So I can go to the doctor and get an x-ray and see hard tissue. I can see where my fillings are, right? I can change the technology and see different information on the same head. I can use an MRI device and see soft tissue, right? I can even do a three-dimensional resonance imaging of your brain. So if we can do this stuff on our bodies, can we use the same technology to understand our cities? So this is kind of, this is, you know, go through the magic of what Josh can create here. I have no idea how he does this, by the way. Um, this is a, a valuation map. This is the miles per tank of looking at your whole region. And you see the industrial waterfronts, huge purple tax bills. So these are your tax bills from no color, for gray is no tax base, so it's a public building, stuff like that, a park. Um, low value at $50,000 an acre, or $50,000 or less in tax bill. As you go up the heat, the value jumps up. Now just to kind of zoom in just a little bit, it's easier to see it with looking at Buffalo. Um, so here's downtown Buffalo. So this is your miles per tank. You're seeing huge tax production out here. When you convert it to value per acre to, f to normalize the productivity of the site, so we're going into miles per gallon now. Watch how the map changes. So what happens is those industrial properties take up tremendous amounts of real estate. And they are what they are. You need that for those properties. Um, but look out here with the suburban commercial pattern. Huge tax bills, but huge land consumers. So you see that disappear. You start to see some heat in downtown. So the value per acre in purple is now $10 million of value per acre. Now this is kind of fun to look at it as a map, but it's real fun when you get into downtown, you start to see more purple and red right through the spine here. A lot of government buildings in here. But this is the 3D model of your map. And I don't know if y'all can read that from back there, but you see these huge spikes jumping up. Let's kind of zoom into the model. This is looking into the lake from uh, east to west. And that's what you're getting out of your downtown. So when you see a bump in color going from green to orange, that's the value change in density of, of tax production. But it's even more significant when you jump to red and then leapfrog up to purple. So we have these three-dimensional models that we've created for you. You can play with them in Google Earth or whatever you want, nerd out on them. You have a huge value chain that comes up the north side. We've done a Williamsville, same thing. In the downtown of Williamsville, we're going to come back to this guy here. There's like this little purple guy that shot up in Williamsville. But you see in the main spine of Williamsville, on Main Street, you're getting oranges, reds, and a huge drop as soon as you get into the residential area of productivity. Um, going out to the commercial area, this is um, Boulevard Mall. So Boulevard Mall is pulling about a beige, and the Main Street's producing, at a per square foot per acre basis, a much higher value than that, mm -hmm. uh, the Village Core. 
this is a, a huge urban renewal project that happened here. Y'all are probably familiar with. Um, this is what's out there today, and this is the value production. So this area is still suppressing value. Most of it's vacant. Um, and you see what's happening on the east side versus what's happening on the north or even the northeast. Um, this is Lewiston. In all of these towns, you see the same pattern. The little main street pops up. Uh, Hamburg. Hamburg's doing really well around the circle in value production. And you can see it just by walking out there. You see the people walking around. You see the activity on the street. Lockport even. Even in the state that Lockport's currently in, you're still seeing reds and oranges. A much higher value production than what you're seeing in Boulevard Mall on a per square foot basis. You'd never think that walking down Lockport's Main Street. Now, we have a lot of fun trying different maps. This is a, a, called a cartogram where you take the area and you change the shape of the area to match its value. So this is a map from 1921 where they want to talk about energy sales. And New York is the one, number one energy consumer. So it got the biggest size. So it's like number one. Wisconsin's number 10 on the list. So it's one tenth the land area of, of New York. What we're trying to do is visualize information for you. So we use these tools. This is what Buffalo felt like in 1950. The city of Buffalo had 51% of the population of the entire region, and now it's down to about 23%. There was a shift of residential outward, so now you're about 11% in Amherst where you were three back in the 50s. This is just what's happened over time. This is just like a, a body mass index for us. Um, your valuation, if we were to do the same thing with your value and cartogram it, this is what it would look like. So the potency of Buffalo swells up, and you can see downtown here, is um, that's the actual land area of downtown. This is how it feels financially. So it's about a 1 to an 11 producer. So for those of you that own a business, what would you do if you had one person in your, in your, in your shop that was responsible for 11% of your office's sales or commissions? And this is what essentially is going on inside the value of your marketplace. Did y'all get that? Is this, I mean, y'all are really quiet. I don't know if, if it's just this is, is this boring or? Okay. It better not be. Um, so this is this is looking at the entire towns as product, and you all know this. There's Buffalo, um, Amherst. Amherst is incredibly valuable. Um, we also have different levels of information that we can get and that we can't get. Um, your retail taxes, we're not allowed to get at a local at a, at a parcel level. It can only get at a zip code level. So we changed the maps to zip code data. This is your property taxes looking from the, from the east westward and the property tax production per acre by zip code. Um, now going into the retail taxes and doing the same thing, you see a spike in retail sales in downtown. Now again, this is not something that you would notice when you walk around on the street, but it's all those small little purchases that add up. The density of those purchases makes downtown a really potent uh, producer. So the total taxes look something like this, property taxes plus retail taxes. Um, your downtown has a lot of exempt real estate in it, about 40% of your downtown. That's kind of normal uh, for downtown. So just something to realize it's your most, uh, it's your most fertile soil, but it's also got your city buildings, your county buildings, and things like that. So just pay attention to that. So just kind of ripping through some properties. This is Summit Mall at about $128,000. Incidentally, I almost got hit by a deer when I was in the parking lot. It was kind of wild. <laughs> I've never been in a parking lot in a mall with a meadow and a deer just comes springing out. Um, this is the shops at West Seneca at about a little bit more. This is a derelict mall, by the way. Um, Walmart, we'll just go ahead and use this Walmart. This is Walmart at Eastgate. Now here's what's interesting. There's the Walmart by itself at about $500,000 of value per acre. When you add on everything else that's with the Walmart, it actually drops in value down to about 400,000. So you actually lose value by adding more stuff to it. Um, and that's all the extra parking lots, basically, to, to drive that. Eastern Hills Mall at about 325,000 an acre. Target plus the Wegmans on transit, 700,000. Um, the Boulevard Mall at 800,000. And then you get into things on, like in uh, Williams, Williamsville. This is a new building that's happening out there. This is about $2 million per, per acre value. What was interesting is just down the street, this little three story guy here is $3 million. Wow. So these things that are in your community, you can learn from. 
what do you want to do more of? What can produce more wealth for your community? I'm not saying build a skyscraper. I mean, just a little guy could do some good stuff. But this was crazy. That's the most valuable building in Williamsville on a per acre basis. Do y'all know this building? It's this little apartment building that's back here. This is that red barn thing, and here it is. And it's got four stories to it. It's in this beautiful location. So, so learn from this, right? This is that purple spike that we saw. Um, here's some other things. I mean, this, this building blew my mind, the Campanile, a beautiful piece of architecture, four million an acre. You'd expect a lot of value out of something that large, right? Just about a block away, you see these guys. This little Mayfair Lane condo project. It's just a two-story building sitting on a parking deck that was built in the 20s. This is pulling 6.5 million an acre in value. And then this phenomenal, this is a, the United Office building at 25, 26 million an acre of value in, in downtown Niagara Falls. This building here in this state that it's in is still pulling 3 million an acre. Uh, an unused building is producing more than the, the Walmart per acre. Um, and then of course, you know, a tall building like that's going to do well, even though it's seen its better days. Now, one of the things that we kind of saw with your data is some really weird stuff. We started seeing all these spikes pop up. That you'd expect concentrated production in the high density going out the spine here, but what are these spikes? And we found out that you have these transformer buildings all over the place. Um, and so they're kind of weird, but they're the same damn building over and over and over again. But check out their value, 21 million an acre. These are the same damn building. This one's, this one's 20 million, that one's four. What's up with that? What's crazy is this building right next door to it is that house. So just changing the property line, we dropped down to a million dollars an acre, this is 21. Just a weird thing that you find in the system, but it's something to have a conversation about. If, you're, if your utility is being charged this kind of taxes, what do you think your utility is gonna do with that tax bill? Pass it on to you all. So it's a way you're essentially hurting yourselves with that, but it's just an anomaly in your system. Now, just to kind of get into some things that are passionate to me is, is someone who's trained in architecture coming to this town and seeing the strong shoulders that you've built yourself on. This is an amazing place. You all know this. It's fantastic architecture. These buildings that have been around since 1925 producing 3 million. This one, 1929, producing 13 million. Think of that asset. This is uh, the Brisbane building at 6 million an acre next to the this is, a, this, is a, this is a postcard from 1911. That building was built in 1895. Or, um, quick. This is my favorite building in your entire community, the Guarantee Building, built in 1896. Think about that. How many generations have come and gone in Buffalo? And this building is still here producing $25 million an acre of value. And is the Boulevard Mall going to be here 100 years from now? You know, this, these are assets you're leaving for your generations in your community. This is an unbelievable piece of architecture. Not only producing cultural wealth, it's producing financial wealth for you. Did y'all get that? Mm -hmm. um, so basically, if you had not even an acre more of that building, it would equal the entire 102-acre Eastern Hills Mall. Now that's a big building. You can't build a lot of those. Let's just say these little guys here, that guy there, if you had 4.7 acres, if you had five acres of that, it would equal the entire 102 acre mall. Apples to apples. So how you look at data and information helps your community make more effective decisions. Right? The more that you look at data and evidence and make an evidence-based assessment, the better your chances are making better decisions. We're just trying to help you see data differently and see the cash flow that's already happening in your community. So just to kind of go through, this is a little, maybe a little bit nerdy. I don't know if, if you want me to you want me to breeze through these. It's kind of hard to see these. Oh, I thought you were asking if I had the handout. Oh, no. But Laura will have a handout. We can actually send this to you as a PDF. This takes time to digest. But this is, this is Buffalo. So you have here no tax value, so we took all that stuff out. Just looking at your tax productivity between... It's a top end, $250,000 down to about zero is blue. So this is your low producing... Uh, property in your in Buffalo. This is the next step up the food chain that's between 250,000 and 500,000 and then I'm oh, sorry here and then this is between 500,000 and a million and this is over a million dollars per acre value. 
So this is your top producer. It's kind of interesting in Buffalo, these are split pretty much 50-50, or you know, same relationship. Um, this overall circle is $6 billion. Buffalo is $6 billion of value. When you put Amherst next to that, you see Amherst is actually $8 billion. So Amherst is a bigger circle. Most of its real estate is tied up in this red stuff. They've got a smaller section of purple stuff. Um, but here's what's interesting about the data. Amherst is 20,000 taxable acres. Buffalo is only 8,000 taxable acres. So Buffalo is punching higher above its weight. It's producing close to $500,000 per acre of net value, while uh, Amherst is about 400,000, 410,000. Did y'all get that? Um, we threw in some other cities. There's Hamburg, um, Chituanga, and Tonawanda. And you see that uh, Tonawanda has a lot of red. Um, Chituanga has a lot of red. The, and you see the values. This is $3 billion. This is $4 billion. That's about $3.6 billion. And here's Niagara Falls. This is our little outlier. Oops. Come back. Niagara Falls is about $1.4 billion of value. Uh, most of its property, look at that, look at how small their purple silver is here. So it's just looking at the data and kind of seeing well, what's going on. I mean, you can see that driving around in uh, Niagara Falls, but it's kind of painful to see it there. Um, I'll skip this one for a second. So we, we kind of nerd out with this stuff. We turned your whole model sideways and just look at the kind of the profile of it. And we do these things called heart monitors. So um, we want to see where your value is. So this is Amherst, and this is that apartment building in downtown Amherst, popping up at $13 million of value per acre. So I guess the question for Amherst is, y'all should do more of that. You know? um, this is Tonawanda. This is one of those utility buildings, so we can go ahead and discount that. But there is a spike in downtown Tonawanda. So here's the pulses of those communities financially. Doing the same for Hamburg and Chiktawanga. And again, these are all patterns that are within your community that you can learn from each other. You know, what, is, what does Tonawanda want to be when it grows up? It's, it's on a path for something. It's Buffalo, you can learn from that. So these are their pulses. And then this is Niagara Falls and its pulse. Tops out at about 26 million an acre, that one building is carrying a lot of weight. Um, this is Buffalo. And so you see the, the value spine of the north side, and then where the park and highway hit it, and then it loses steam real quickly. So putting, putting uh, Niagara next to Buffalo, this is how they look. Niagara actually peaks out pretty close to what Buffalo's peaking out at, but Buffalo's got a whole lot more stuff in it. Did y'all get that? We have a lot of fun with this stuff, by the way. It's, so this, we, threw, we, we had Syracuse, New York, so we went ahead and threw Syracuse next to Buffalo. Oops. So this is, this is Syracuse. Syracuse has the unfortunate situation where they plowed a highway right through the middle of it, so you see this valley here of low value. This is from the university side, so that's actually by the medical campus of the hill, and this is downtown. So they've actually got two downtowns trying to work with this highway in the middle of it. Um, and they're doing quite well. So even though they're a smaller community than you all, they have a higher potency in their downtown at 35 million an acre. Um, this is Chapel Hill. We had that data set, so we threw that in here. Um, this is a, the entire county only has 130,000 people in it, but they have $52 million worth of wealth at the center of their city. So what did they do differently? Did they eat more salad? Did they have more kale? I mean, what is it? These are, these are conversations that maybe could be the next step. Um, that we, we have a lot of pun fun. Um, you had transit road and we also have transit, so we did the tale of two transits. Joshua grabbed, went out the train line and grabbed a, a, a pedestrian shed, a circle around each train station. What will somebody walk? Probably about five to ten minutes in, in either direction. We grabbed all the real estate on the train station and then we went over to the transit and did the same thing. So we grabbed the same distance through here. We had all the values, so we figured out what's, how are these things producing? What's the cash flow in these? Here's how they cash flow out. The total value, and these are the same land areas, mind you. The, so the same boundary. This one's worth close to a billion dollars inside that boundary. This one's about 700, let's, let's give it $800,000 or $800 million of value. Huge numbers, right? But this one's only 40% taxable. There's a lot of non-taxable stuff in here. This one is 81% taxable. 
So you would think that it would do better. It's got more real estate that's in productivity, but check this out. It's only pulling about $400,000 an acre of value, where this one's close to a million dollars an acre of value. As you look at your public investments, think of the return on that investment as well. You're getting a bigger pun uh, a punch for your weight there. So, um, you know, Niagara Falls is worth more than the Sabres and the Bills combined. It's a paltry $1 billion, but it's still more, worth more than them. Buffalo, you can throw the Yankees onto it. The Buffalo is worth $6.4 billion. Did you all talk about your communities this way? The $6.4 billion asset? Or Niagara Falls, the whole entire county is worth more than every single professional sports team in the entire state. Who would have thought? Or Erie is worth five times all the professional sports teams. I mean, just going back to Buffalo, Buffalo's 7.4 bills. Um, maybe you all should buy the team. Anyway, I think you should personally. But any, so, you know, you think about the owner of the Buffalo Bills. You know, do you think they know what C.J. Spiller's towel bill is? Of course. You know, if they know this kind of level of information, are you asking those same questions? Do you understand the cash flow of your community? Do you understand the costs of your community's decisions? I can tell you what the sodium content is in a bag of potato chips. Can you tell me what the cost of a road is? What it costs to pave transit? What it costs to plow transit? These are questions to be asked in your community. This is detailed to get into. And also understand there's behavioral economics going on and how I respond as a developer with the policies in your community, right? So this is just exhibiting how this stuff works. This is the window tax in England. In 1696, King William III instituted a window tax because they wanted a non-invasive way to gauge wealth. Glass was expensive in the 1700s, or 1700s, so the more windows you had, the higher your shillings rate. Over that 100-year period of time, people started boarding up their windows to avoid taxes. <laughs> the physical environment changed because of policy. This is one of the more obscene, obscene examples that we've ever seen. This is Cheyenne, Wyoming. Josh can go into the computer and, and take, there's building value and there's dirt value. You can just remove the building and just look at how dirt's valued. So on a per acre basis, you'd expect the world to look like this, that everybody's at the same color, right? So all of your neighbors are the same value per acre as you are. When we were showing the map, I was presenting to the community, I was like, hey, what's going on here? Where this is blue, this is $15,000 an acre, and as soon as you cross the street, it's orange at 35,000. You essentially double the value per acre just by crossing the street. The tax assessor was sitting in the front row, she raises her hand, and she's like, you don't understand. And I said, what don't I understand? And she goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the value. That makes sense. I'm like, hang on, I'm like, I got three quarters of a mile street here, three quarters of a mile street here, another half mile and half mile. I've got three miles of infrastructure. I've got the biggest site on the street, which probably means I have the most capacity. If I have the most capacity, I get the most trips. More trips, more car accidents, which means more fire calls. There's probably more commerce happening here, which means more theft, more police calls. I get a discount for all that extra stuff? And she's like, yeah, that's our standard. And I asked her, so where do you get this standard? Did, did Moses deliver it to you? I mean, where'd this come from? You can't change it? I mean, these are policies that we inflict ourselves with. Just have a conversation and see whether it works. So we're, we're looking at your real estate. This is looking north out of, out of downtown. Uh, this is what your land value looks per acre. So just by crossing the street, you're essentially like tripling your land value. Look at these anomalies in here, or over here. How would you like to, how would you like to be this person here, where they're paying, what is that, six times their neighbor's land value per acre, just for the dirt, just for the opportunity of having dirt next to their neighbor. You see, this is another angle looking out of the city. You know, so just be aware of these things, visualize them, have the conversation with your assessor, and realize these aren't invisible market forces that are making me behave this way. I mean, Darth Vader's not steering me around. These are policies that I'm gonna choose the path of least resistance in your community, and understand that you can actually hurt yourself with your policies. You know, put the gun down and do the math. So thank you, thanks for the time.